If you have your Bible with you, again, invite you to turn to Romans 7, and there is one verse there to read, and then a verse in chapter 8, and these will be the source of our study this morning. Romans chapter 7 and verse 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. In the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then verse 13 of chapter 8, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us as we look into his word this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to be together and to consider the truth of your word. And Lord, this is a, a section of the scripture we come to in some degree with fear and trembling, with sadness and sorrow that such things were written and that we have in our own hearts a and understanding of them. So help us, we pray, as we come to open up and then to apply your word. We say this and ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, it, it may well be that you came with the desire and with the hope that in coming to faith in Christ, you would enter into a period of peace. You wanted to have peace with God. Perhaps you heard the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, come unto me all you that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And the word of God tells us that that is true and if you have come to faith in Christ you can testify that in coming to faith in Christ you knew a rest and you knew a peace and you knew a satisfaction that you had never known before. But it is equally true that in coming to faith in Jesus Christ, you entered into warfare. Now, the reality is that there are forces arrayed against you. And we, as Christians, we recognize, in the words of the theologians, the world and the flesh and the devil. They are warring against you. Your flesh wars against your progress in Christ's likeness. The world seduces. The enemy of our soul fights and labors to discourage, to get us involved in sin, to lose our integrity. And if he could do it, he would remove us from the grip of our Heavenly Father and from our Savior. So there are those who are fighting against us. And the question is, are we equally engaged in that fight? You see, it's possible for someone to make war against you and for you not to make war against them. So you think of those places, uh, and again, I mentioned World War II last night when the uh, German army was uh, taking over vast swaths of Europe. There were nations where there was very little resistance. And Germany came with their tanks and they came with their bombers and they came with their troops, and because the people in those lands were afraid, they essentially raised their hands, and rather than fight to the death, rather than fight for their homeland, they caved in. And what this text before us is telling us, that as Christians, in regard to the fight within, it is a fight that we must engage in. And so I want to say a little bit <coughs> about the background in Romans 7, but I particularly want to expound in your hearing today Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. 
where the Word of God says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And as we look at that text this morning, I want to consider the fight we must endure, the truth that we must seek, and the hope that we must embrace. The fight we must endure, or we might say the fight that we must engage in, the fight we must endure, the truth we must seek, the hope we should embrace. So fight, hope, and trust are our big words in this hour. So let's begin with fight. He says here, or speaks here, about a fight to the death. Now, that's a fight. This is not fisticuffs. This is not simply a warning that is given to our flesh and to our remaining sin that wars within us. This is a call for us to fight that sin and to put that sin to death. And in this, in this statement here that the Apostle Paul makes and that he's making in the end of Romans 7 and then bringing out in a variety of ways in, in Romans 8 is this reality that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be an unhindered, flat ground progress to the celestial city in which you just simply day by day become more and more like Jesus without any resistance from without or from within. That when this new life begins, that when we embrace Christ and have then a desire to be like Christ, and you say to yourself in the inward man, as the word of God is read, as the law of God is expounded, as the desires and commandments of God are made known and you read and study what kind of man or woman or young person God wants you to be outwardly and inwardly, there is a delight to say, God, that's exactly what I want to be. That's the person I want to be. When I read 1 Corinthians 13 and read that love is patient and kind and doesn't seek its own and keeps no record of wrong, Lord, that's the kind of person that I want to be. When I read in your word about somebody that is tender and, and pure of heart, that's uh, able to engage in uh, relationships with other people without ever any thought of impurity, that I'm able to live and walk in this world where there are so many visual traps all around me and be able to walk through that with purity and integrity. God, that's the man you want me to be. That's the woman you want me to be. That's the way you want me to think. It's the way you want me to feel. That's how you want me to be. And God, that's how I want to be. And yet, the Bible says that in doing that, your flesh will war against you. That if there is in you a desire, a will to do what is good that you are going to find yourself in an extended period of warfare. You're going to find that in living in this world, there is daily pervasive temptation to not be and to not do what God has called you to be and to do. Every day, all through the day, in a variety of ways and means, the believer in Jesus will find themselves, if they are truly engaged, if they are truly actively pursuing righteousness, they will find themselves engaged in a fight. And the reason you're engaged in a fight is that there remains in you, and this is what we're going to focus on in this hour, there remains in you something that is contrary to this law of God and to this will of Christ. There is this matter of the flesh. And that that flesh is not only one day conquered and put to death definitively, but that that flesh is like one of these old-fashioned monster movies where when I was a kid, I loved the old Universal monster movies with Frankenstein and 
all the rest. And so in the first movie, Frankenstein, uh, the, mon not the, 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 the monster gets uh, trapped in a burning windmill, and you watch it, oh, he's dead. Well, till Bride of Frankenstein, and then you find out that he survives the fire, and at the end of that, he gets blown up in a, in a laboratory explosion until Son of Frankenstein, where you find out that, and on and on it goes. You keep thinking that he's dead. That's it. I've done that. I've conquered, and yet here is this inner beast, this flesh, is arisen again and must be wrestled against and killed again. And the Bible uses a variety of terms to describe this. Wrestling, striving, fighting, warring, killing. We have within us this contrary spirit, this matter of our flesh, where we say to ourselves, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to be, and yet, when it comes time to doing it, to loving to being patient, to being kind, to being pure, or whatever it is at that moment, this war is stirred up. And we're going to consider in our next section uh, today, or this afternoon, the war with uh, the world, and then tonight and tomorrow we're going to look at the, the matter of the devil. But what we're dealing with here is the reality that if the world left you alone, if the world no longer sent out its siren cry, if the world no longer seduced you or pressured you or tempted you, and if somehow you woke up and you found, you checked your phone and you found the news is out there, the devil died this morning. Ding dong, the witch is dead. The devil's dead. If the devil were to die this morning, you would still find that there is a war that you are engaged in, you would find that there are propensities of your own heart to be and to do what you say you don't want to be and don't want to do. And so here is a person set free by grace, and that's very obvious in this, liberated by grace and empowered by the Spirit. They're striving to walk by the Spirit, and not by the flesh. This is a real Christian that we are talking about. And yet even that one finds that there is this contradiction within them. This way of thinking, this way of acting, at times this way of speaking that is so contrary to what we know to be the will of God. And the reality is that even the believer striving and wanting and yearning in the deepest part of their heart, and God before you, you know this is who I am. I want to be pure. I want to do right. I want to obey you. That that very disposition stirs up warfare. Inwardly and at times outwardly in words or attitudes or actions, that kind of believer will act or speak or think or feel contrary to who and what they are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, Paul shows us that there will come with that striving a weariness and a distress about this contradiction in our lives, this back and forth, this jekyll and hyde. I actually read that book a few years ago, and I, I was struck by it that this is, it's really like Romans 7. And it's a man in the story, Jacqueline Hyde, of, of a man who creates some kind of chemical formula to separate the spirit from the flesh. Or in his case, the good in man versus the bad in man. And the idea is that if I could just extricate my flesh if I could get rid of my flesh, disembody my flesh, then I can be thoroughly and purely good. And that flesh turns into this beast, Mr. Hyde, devoid of good. And the hope was, let him do his thing, let him go his way, and then I can be good and virtuous. 
And the sad reality is that Dr. Jekyll then begins to long to turn back into Mr. Hyde. Because he's not a converted man. He's just a man trying to be good. But here we are, not Jekyll and Hyde, but here we are, the Christ indwelt, the Spirit indwelt believer, and yet there are times when where does that thought come from? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I hateful toward my brother or my sister in Christ? Why do I speak words that are divisive? Why do I have passions that displease God? Where does this come from within me? And Paul says this fight at times wearies and discourages me. Charles Spurgeon in preaching on this text said this, and he's really trying to be encouraging with this. He says, now listen, if you know what I'm talking about, and do you know what I'm talking, am I making sense? Am I just talk- Does this make sense? Do you, do you know what this is like? That you want to be purely, fully, totally Christ-like? That that's really what you want? If God were to say to you, listen, what do you want to be? What do you want to have? I want to have victory. I want to walk through this life regularly, consistently in victory. That's what I want. I want a life devoid of this fight. And Spurgeon says this fight is actually the proof that Christ is at work in you. Because before you came to faith in Christ, you were never engaged in this fight. Sin didn't bother you in this way. So he says this. This is Charles Spurgeon. The man who never (laughs) strives against the sin which dwells in him, who indeed is not conscious of any sin to strive against, that is the man who we may begin to question whether he knows anything at all of the spiritual life. He who has no inward pain may well suspect that he is abiding in death, abiding therefore under constant condemnation, But that man who feels a daily striving after deliverance from evil, who is panting and pining and longing and agonizing to become holy, even as God is holy, that is the justified man. The man to whom every sin is a misery, to whom the thought of iniquity is intolerable, he is the man who may with confidence declare, there is now no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus." Souls that sigh for holiness are not condemned to eternal death, for their sighing proves that they are in Christ Jesus. Paul said, do you know what it is like to war? Do you know what it's like to feel this push and this pull? Do you know what it's like to wonder, is this ever, ever going to end? Will there ever be that perfect alignment of desire and practice and inward life? You know, there's a hymn we sing, I, we have not known thee as we ought, we haven't loved thee as we ought. And that hymn does not simply acknowledge those things are true. It longs for the day when we will love and serve and fear him as we ought. So he says, do you know what this is like? And I'm asking, do you know what this is like? Your flesh will fight against you. And the question is, will you fight back? Lord, I want to love this person. And then you interact and the flesh rises up in hatred and animosity. They say something or they do something and everything within you is repelled by them. That's the flesh fighting back. And the question is, will you now kill that? And not just say to yourself, well, I tried to do what's right. No, I fought against it, it fought against me, and I'm now going to kill it. That's the idea here in Romans chapter 8. When one wrestles against you, we wrestle back. When temptations rise, we fight Sometimes the Bible says we flee, but we, we, we are not passive, and we must not be compliant. Look at the stakes that are laid out in this text. I mean, we're not talking here about what kind of Christian life really we're ultimately going to live. We're 
actually talking about whether or not we are going to spiritually survive. If you live according to the flesh, that is, if there is no resistance, no fight in you, if everything in your Christian life has to be just handed to you on a, on a silver platter, well, I'll, I'll love the people at church until they bother me. Well, once they bother me, once they sin against me, well, that's it. Is that it? Is that what love requires that we do? Do we just give up? Or do we fight? Say, God, you've called me to love. You've called me to forbearance. You've called me to perseverance. You've called me to love here. This is what you've called me to do. Will I do it? Will I fight with the help of the Holy Spirit? Or will I just cave in? Somebody says, I'm going to battle my lust until I see something. And then rather than fight my lust, I allow my lust to be stirred up and to take root. That's what the world does. That's what the flesh wants. Are we going to do that? He says, if you live that way, you're going to die. And what does he mean? Well, what he means there rather clearly and rather starkly is spiritual death. That is, you will go to hell. If you don't fight your sin, if you're not engaged in this fight, then you have every reason to question whether or not you're truly in Christ. I don't care what you know. I don't care what your theology is. I don't care if you know the 1689 backward and forward. If you are not engaged in this fight, then we question whether or not we are truly in Christ. A man or woman or young person who cooperates with the world, who cooperates with their own flesh, and cooperates with the devil and the destruction of their soul ought not to be surprised that their soul is destroyed in the end. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven that does not mean that person who does the will of the Father in heaven is a person engaged in fighting and in warfare. Now this brings us to the second heading, and that is trust. So we talked about fight, let's talk about trust. And this deals with the unique way in which Christians are involved with the fight against their sin. So that's why I began last night with the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. How do we fight our sin? Now, there are some people who, to some degree, people in the world, who are not happy with what they are, who want to change. They're tired of the power of certain things over them, and they're determined not to be that way anymore. And they may even seek help in the fight. So somebody doesn't want to be a drunk anymore. Somebody's gotten involved in drugs. Maybe somebody is sick and tired of the effect of pornography in their life, and, and they want to be done with it. And they're willing even to take some extreme measures to fight their sin. Some might even use some kind of a religion. And some of that religion might even be, broadly speaking, Christian that helps them to, quote-unquote, be a better person or to give them motivation to do better and to be better, to turn from their addictions and all of the rest. But what we find here in this text where Paul says, if you buy the Spirit, is that the true Christian faith is not merely a matter of superior morality or actions or philosophy. It gets back to this fact that our faith is rooted in the supernatural. Not God as some higher power to aid us in our weakness, but a real, true, triune God who made us and who has loved us and redeemed us, the one who sent his Son to bear the wrath due to our sins and who are given the gift of of God himself, the Holy Spirit, to indwell us. Now this chapter, my <coughs> brother read some of it. You can go on and read it here uh, later on today. You'll find that it has a lot of wonderful things to say 
<coughs> about the reality of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. But I want to focus on one element of it for now. And that is the Holy Spirit is God's primary means to aid us in our fight against sin. That is that we must trust him and call upon him in that fight. This is not a matter of lip service or something that we quickly acknowledge in our battle, but rather it becomes our hope in the battle. As I see people striving against sin in a variety of ways, and, and particularly I, I see it in the fight against lust. And I imagine Australia is probably not that different from the U.S. The sadly alarming numbers of professing Christians, men and women, old and young, involved in sin and particularly the internet has given an increased access to this and then somebody finally gets sick of it and they decide they're going to they're going to battle their lust but often that battle focuses upon a list of rules or laws that someone has created and my fear or my concern is not that there's not maybe some degree of wisdom here, but the question is, where is the help of the Holy Spirit in this? If your main hope in fighting sin is software, well, I put, I put a software filter on my... And that's it. If you buy software, put to death the deep... No, well, no, well, we, I have an accountability partner. If you, by your accountability partner, put to... No, if you, by the Spirit. And I'm not saying there may not be wisdom in saying, Spirit of God, help me. And I need, I might need to pluck out a right, I might need to get rid of this technology altogether. I might need to have barrier after barrier. But Spirit of God, my hope is in you. Empower me. Flood my heart with the fear of God and the love of Christ so that when I say, God, you've given me victory, I don't go on and, I, you know, that I'm praising this software and that software and this friend and that friend, but that the honor and glory goes to God. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Your first and last line of defense against sin ought not to be technology or surgery, and I want to be careful, or chemicals, or your small group or your own gutted out determination. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying poo-poo to all of this. I'm saying let it have its place, but let it not have the preeminent place. I found a way to conquer my tongue. It's called tape. And I wrap it around my mouth. And when I find that when I wrap all praise and glory to duct tape, that when I have duct tape over my mouth, I don't sin with my tongue. Well, what about in your heart? Oh, well, that's a cauldron, a seething cauldron of cruel thoughts and accusation and word. But they don't get it. No, listen. Yeah, all right, maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe some people need to put tape over their mouth. I actually knew a guy in my church. He used to take one of these uh, boxers mouth guards. He bought it at a, uh, at a sporting goods store. And he'd just stick it in his mouth. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. <laughs> and that way, if he thought, well, if I have to say something, I'm going to have to put it out and hopefully think about or just go, mmm, mmm. He was so tired of sinning with his mouth. Okay, fine. But brethren, what this text tells us is that we need the power of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit can do what nothing else can do. If your hope's in your software, you know what? You can get around your software. Your lust will find some way. 
If it's your accountability partner, you can get around your accountability partner because your technology, your accountability partner, or chemicals or surgery or whatever it is that you want to conquer your sin does not have the power that the Spirit of God does. The Word of God tells us in, in Isaiah 40 and 29 through 31 that he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall utterly fall but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our brother in the uh, this morning, I had this text down, but he prayed from Ephesians 3 that we would be granted strength in the inner man by the Holy Spirit. He does give power to the believer. He also grants illumination. Jesus said that when the Spirit of God came, he would guide the mind of his disciples into the truth that he had taught them. He would bring the truth to remembrance. Now, the Holy Spirit does that in our lives, not in the way he did that with the apostles, but he does that in our lives through taking the scriptures that we have read and that we have heard and that we have hidden in our hearts and bringing them out so that in our spiritual warfare, the Word of God tells us that we have these defensive armor, we have breastplate and helmet and all of the rest, and we have one defensive weapon, that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What did the Spirit of God help Jesus to do when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? How did he help him? What did he bring to his heart and bring to his mind? Brought the word of God to him. Word of God that Jesus had hidden away in his heart as a young person, the spirit of God aiding him in his temptation there in the wilderness. Spirit of God will help you. One of the great fights I had uh, the last year or so has been in regard to loving certain people who wounded me. And in all my spiritual, or not my, all my pastoral life, I don't know that I had been as wounded as I was in this situation. And the temptation always comes to fixate on it, to rehearse things that were said, to think about the ways that these people have sinned or are hypocritical or something like that. You know, all the ways God wants me to think. And I, I'm saying that sarcastic. No, God doesn't want me to think that way. Because love doesn't think that way. And what the Spirit of God does in my heart and mind whenever it starts to go that way is 1 Corinthians 13. And the question is not, did they love me? I can't can't do anything with that but will I love them and will my love be the kind of love that the Bible talks about so the spirit of God brings that to my mind when I'm tempted to be impatient with someone the word of God comes love is patient well you know I don't want to be patient love is patient love is kind love keeps no record of wrong so you mean when I'm thinking of my, you did this to me, you did that to me, you did that to me, you did that to me, blah, 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 blah. No, love doesn't, love doesn't do that. That's not the Spirit of God. You're overcome with temptation in regard to sensuality. The Spirit of God brings the truth of God, the hope of God's Word, examples of God's Word. That's what I'm talking about. The Spirit of God also aids us. So he aids us in power. He aids us in illumination. He aids us in the focus of our heart and our minds upon the Savior. Hebrews 3 and verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses also is faithful in all his house. In chapter 12 in, in Hebrews, this wonderful exhortation that is given after the cloud of witnesses 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That all goes together. Lay aside the sin thing that so easily ensnares you. I've sometimes read this text as though these are a series of disconnected counsels. So lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. That's point one. Point two, run with endurance. Point three, looking unto Jesus. That's not how it's to be read. You lay aside your sin looking unto Jesus. You lay aside every weight looking unto Jesus. You run with endurance looking unto Jesus. That's what he is saying. Fix your mind on Christ lest you grow weary and discouraged in your souls. There's one who died for you, who liberated you, one interceding for you, pleading for you, one who will forgive you and cleanse you in your failure, who will receive you into glory at the end. And remember, he is your life. Remember, he's why you're in the fight, that he's worthy of your labors and effort and striving. In your fight against sin, don't focus on your sin. Focus on the one who died for your sin. Don't pour all your concentration, in this sense, into the enemy. Rather, focus it upon that one who lived for you and died for you. When I've read memoirs about soldiers in war, it's interesting, at least from an American perspective, you know, because we're Americans, we're, we're, you know, flag and freedom and patriotism and all this, and you get the idea that these men running out to battle, that they, that they care preeminently about the flag and about American ideals. But what they'll tell you is that when they're in the foxhole and the bombs are going off and the bullets are flying, that they are motivated to fight by the man next to them. That it ultimately gets down to, I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for you. And ultimately, as believers, we have to look to the Lord Jesus in that way. Why am I fighting? Why am I, why am I, here? Why am I striving? Why do I go through this? Warfare. Why is it that one, Lord, I just want to obey you. I just want to do what's right. I just want to be pure. I just want to be loving. And why does there have to be a fight? Well, it's because he laid hold of you. Because he loved you and he died for you. And because he's shaping you and he's molding you. He is why we're in the fight. All right, so that's fight and trust. And now, very briefly, hope. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, he says, you will live. You'll die. Remember, we said, really, that's talking about eternal death. It's talking about damnation. If we're not in this fight, if you know what I'm talking about. You've never been in this fight. No, never, never a struggle. If that's, if, I, I don't understand that kind of Christianity. Either you've never had real holy desires or you're fooling yourself. But he says, if you will engage by the Spirit and the power of the Spirit, saturated with the Word, with a focus upon the person of Christ, you're gonna, you are those who will not die, you will live. So again, a matter of life and death, eternal life. And as is so often the case in the scriptures, eternal life is not something that we merely enter into when we die. It's something we enjoy now. Eternal life is life, abundant life. It's real life. It's living. And that's why the Christian can, even in the midst of all of this, even as he cries out, a wretched man that I am, and he says, who's going to set me free in this battle? Well, his next breath is, it's not like he says, wow, that's a tough question. I, I got to come back to that. Now, he knows even then that Christ is his hope. 
And he knows because Christ is his hope and because he is engaged in the battle and his sin wearies him and bothers him and that he's going to resist it and he's going to fight, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So if we walk according to the Spirit, our eyes focused on Christ, saturated with the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God. Now that doesn't mean that every single time that we, in that particular moment, that we don't ever fail or we don't ever sin, but when we do, we go back to the person of Christ, and that's why, again, a Christian in the midst of warfare can have joy. They can have joy because they have life right now and they have the prospect of the life that is to come. And the prospect of the life to come is sweetened by the fact that one day this war (coughs) in all, (coughs) excuse me, in all its manifestations will be over. And that we as the people of God will stand victorious. And that victory will not simply be the well done, good and faithful servant. And it's not just the cessation of war. That's going to be wonderful. There will be no more temptation. It will be that we will see him and we will be like him. And we will join the church above comprised of justified sinners made perfect. When we see him, we'll be like him. And the longing of our heart, which undergirds all of this, is that we want to be like Jesus. You will be forever. Stumbling, fighting, weary, child of God. Child of God who at times gets so sick of who they are, sick of their failure, You're able to say before God, this isn't who I want to be, and yet sometimes this is who I am. And who I want to be, I'm not, and what I don't want to be, sometimes I am. And I'm a wretched man. Wretched man, not that I was, but wretched man that I am. That I should know what I know and experience what I've experienced of the grace of God, the truth of God written on my heart and on my mind, and yet this is how I respond, this is what I'm like, a wretched man that I am, there's going to come a time when those words will never, ever be spoken again. If you long to be like Jesus, you will be. If you long for the war to end, it will end. That's the hope of those who are in the fight. But I say here today, if you're not fighting... If you are content to have what some people have, it's what I call a heaven-only approach to Christianity. A heaven-only approach to Christianity is, listen, don't worry about all this stuff. Just trust Jesus, and you get to go to heaven when you die. And sin, schmin, fight, schmite, you know, who cares about any of that? So Jesus is your get-out-of-hell-free card. Just make a decision, pray a prayer, and You'll go, you get to go to heaven and see this Jesus you don't really care about and you don't strive to be like and you don't long to please. Now listen, if that's your Christianity, then you really don't have Christianity. But there is hope even for you. And that hope does not re- rest in fresh resolve. It does not rest in your saying, well, I'll, I'll try harder this week. It rests in a real apprehension of the Savior and the real indwelling of the Spirit of God in your heart. And if you'll come to that Savior with a determination to be cleansed of your sin and to become like Him, yeah, you're going to enter into a fight. But it's a fight that you'll win. And in that striving, even in that striving, there is hope. Hope in mercy hope in the spirit, hope in the world to come.
Well, let's pray and let's ask God's blessing upon these truths. Our Father, thank you for these moments in your word, and we do pray, Heavenly Father, that you will aid us all in whatever aspect of the fight that we are in, to fight with the power of the Spirit, to fight with the illumination of the Spirit, to fight with the focus that the Spirit gives upon the person and work of Christ. We ask all of this in his matchless name. Amen.